go ahead and get started because I know Dr. Vedada has a lot of great slides to show and a lot of good information to share, so I want to um, try to stay on time. Uh, Dr. Badada uh, comes to us from Ethiopia. He's one of our uh, really important key collaborators in the Durable Rust Resistance and Wheat Project that's based here at Cornell in Ronnie Hoffman's Office of the National Programs, Cal's. Uh, he got his uh, BSc in Plant Science from Ethiopian Alamaya University. And then in 1979, he made the bold move to go to the University of Arkansas and he got his MSc there uh, in uh, the Department of Plant Breeding and Agronomy, specializing really as a cotton breeder. He went back to Ethiopia and worked uh, in the Ethiopian research system for a number of years. And then in 1992, he was awarded his PhD from the University of Arkansas. So four years prior, he had, he had gone there uh, again to the Department of Plant Breeding and Agronomy. And he <coughs> did his thesis uh, also working in cotton. Then when he returned to Ethiopia, he went back to the Ethiopian Institute for Agricultural Research, which I guess was probably called EARO at that time, the yes. Ethiopian Agricultural yes. Research Organization. And they um, told him to switch crops and start working in wheat. And we're so glad that that move happened. Uh, he has worked for the Ethiopian uh, National Program for over 40 years. He served as a national cotton coordinator and then before moving into wheat, then he became the National Wheat Coordinator, then he became the National Cereals <coughs> Project Coordinator, and most recently he's taken on the role of um, uh, PI for the DRW project in Ethiopia. He's got two children and um, his family, and he live in the RC region of Ethiopia. Um, he works at the Kalumsa Agricultural Research Center, which is in the sort of bread basket of Ethiopia. And it's now the uh, bread wheat center of excellence for all of East Africa. Um, Dr. Banada, I think you'll see today, uh, it's quite clear, is really special that it's the needs of the small farmers that really drive him uh, to do his work every day. And he's so committed to them. He's gotten eight new varieties. Uh, durable, rust-resistant varieties out to small-scale um, farmers in Ethiopia. So we, in the larger DRW project, globally, we feel like the work that Dr. Madada has done is a real model um, for, the, for the rest of the um, DRW community. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Madada. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my talk would be about uh, wheat rusts and the small farmers in Ethiopia. Uh, as you see over there, uh, this is yellow rust. Uh, this is stem rust. Uh, you might have heard about UG99. Published to fight the UG99 uh, stem rust race. And uh, it started in Uganda, next door to Ethiopia, uh, quickly into Kenya, Ethiopia, Yemen, and then uh, the last stop, I guess, so far is uh, Iran. So this is a big threat. And since Ethiopia is the largest wheat producer in East Africa, it was a big threat for us. And luckily, uh, we are partnered to DRRW. And since 2005, even before <coughs> DRRW was established in 2008, we're working on screening international nurseries. And uh, uh, we use uh, wheat uh, uh, from cement germplasm, hundreds and thousands, ICARDA, USDA, and other, other national programs. Uh, so Ethiopia's role is to screen, uh, generate data, and share with the international partners. 
We also do regular uh, rest surveys and try to track the movement of uh, UG99 and its variants uh, across uh, Africa. Uh, so we have uh, uh, 13 uh, national uh, research centers who cooperate in the national uh, programs. <coughs> Well, uh, if we see here, this is not uh, maturity. This is uh, Saptoria disease as compared to a resistant variety next to it. So Rustus, Saptoria, uh, and also other minor diseases are concerned to the Ethiopian farmer. <coughs> here we see uh, Rest resistant variety. Uh, this, sorry, this variety is for the lowland areas. We call it Kakava. It came out of our DRRW project. And this variety is uh, being multiplied on the state farmers. It's called Denda. It's, uh, both of them are uh, of Simit origin, and now they are in. Your farmer's hands. Well, he, this is just picture showing a field day. Uh, uh, at this field day, sorry, at field day we have we see Sarah here. I think uh, Katie over here, and Linda. Uh, it's not a good picture, but so we work together as much as possible with the farmers and our partners visit us often. And this is a, a moral boost for the small farmers. Well, as an introduction, uh, wheat is a major food security crop produced on about 1.8, we also say 2 million hectares in Ethiopia. If we compare, 150,000 hectares in Kenya. This is really the largest area. Uh, it's, it's faced with serious periodical threat from uh, uh, rustus, yellow, stem rust, as the major threats. And also since 2009, <coughs> I mean 1999, UG99 has been a major problem, and we have been involved uh, in this uh, work since 2005. Uh, and also, 2010, we had a yellow rust epidemic. Uh, farmers, small farmers, uh, suffered big losses uh, in their uh, production. Well, uh, the wheat farmers, in Ethiopia, are 95 percent of the wheat producers. They make a large uh, proportion. Uh, periodically, they suffer from uh, limited use of uh, improved technologies. And also, they suffer from uh, They are not fully protected. Uh, we can give example of yellow rust epidemic in 2010, uh, stem rust epidemic in 1993, and yellow rust in 1987. And uh, farmers are not spraying their fields. So uh, we have to constantly uh, provide them with tolerant or resistant variety. Well, this is how Ethiopian farmers cultivate their land. These have been uh, the single plow. It has been there for centuries. And also, uh, the middle picture shows how they thresh their crop. 
if we look at the wheat area, <coughs> the darker um, area shows the major wheat areas. And the lighter green one is minor, but this is a little bit an old uh, map. Oh, wheat is covering more area, and also the minor areas have become major areas. Well, the RRW is mainly involved in capacity building. The capacities include greenhouses built at Ambo, at Debrezeit, and Kulmta Research Centers, labs enhanced at Ambo, Debrezeit, Kulmta. Now, Ambo can do race analysis uh, uh, annually. Irrigation system enhanced at Debrezeit. Uh, new irrigation system is near completion at Kulumsa. Uh, as a breakthrough, we have a plot planter and a plot combine purchased for Kulumsa. Kulumsa is a quarter, uh, headquarter for the national uh, research program. And also, <coughs> testing of international wheat germ fly against UG989, key to international collaboration. Key partners include CIMIT, ICARDA, USDA, Agricultural, I mean, Advanced Research Institutes, and other national cultural research system. Uh, these include uh, from Asia, Africa, uh, and other parts of the world that way. So we receive their materials and uh, share our data with them. We use two seasons at Debrezeit and Kolumsa. We uh, annually do joint evaluation with our partners and sharing of data. And uh, <coughs> we're continuing with uh, capacity building uh, sur rest surveillance is a uh, uh, major part of our uh, project. Uh, there are uh, 14, 13 national research centers and one university are involved. We have done timely awareness creation to our breeders and uh, farmers. And also <coughs> annual uh, countrywide rest tracking and recording is in place, sharing of survey data and sport samples with our partners. In-service training is part of the capacity building. We send annually our uh, breeders and pathologists to Nijoro, Kenya, uh, for two week training. And many have gone to agriculture, uh, I mean advanced research industries like Minnesota, uh, Sydney, Australia, and also regularly in service training at CIMIT. Uh, BGR technical <coughs> workshops uh, has helped us to enhance our capacities as well. Uh, in terms of capacity building, beginning uh, 2006, uh, this is Dr. Jesse Dubin, who worked uh, for a long period at CIMIT and also in USDA. Uh, he came uh, three times to Kolumsa to uh, train uh, pathologists on standardization of uh, rust square scoring. And also this is uh, A greenhouse at Ambo. We have a similar greenhouse at uh, Debrezeit also. And uh, another one at Kulumsa. So these have uh, really enhanced our capacities uh, in our rest uh, research. Uh, 
What we see here is a generator, a tambo, real big generator. Uh, this was not in the plan, but uh, uh, during uh, a monitoring of the centers, it was felt that uh, uh, we should have that. Uh, and the next one is uh, deep freezer tambo also. Well, uh, our approach is to develop uh, varieties. We do regular crossing and we introduce uh, uh, germplasm from Simit, Icarda. Uh, we regularly receive uh, uh, varieties from uh, other NARS. Uh, we do selection and testing. As I've said, joint evaluation is regularly there. And we go through participatory variety selection, uh, national variety trials, uh, variety verification trials, and then we release varieties. After release, we go into seed increase, which uh, is then formally and informally. Informally with farmers. Um, in this picture, we see uh, Simit scientists, uh, Ravi uh, in the middle, and uh, Joshi, I think, is uh, uh, in, the, in Nepal. Uh, is a Simit. Uh, uh, breeder, Dr. Bakala is an Ethiopian, also semi representative in Addis. So uh, regularly we work with them and evaluate and advance uh, our uh, varieties. Here also we see Dr. Osman, right here from Icarda, with one of our senior bre breeders at Kulumsa. Well, uh, after release of varieties, we do promotion. Uh, usually, participatory variety selection is wh what we use on station and also on farmers' fields. Uh, This is on station at Kulumsa. This is uh, on farmer's field, uh, precisely at uh, Makida's uh, uh, village. Makida is a farmer who went to China uh, last year. Here also is demonstration and also um, is at Kulumsa, and this one is on farmer's fields. This is how we do training. Usually, uh, a range of, depending on the uh, district, 60 to 130 farmers. And uh, we include development agents and a supervisor. And uh, uh, gender is uh, uh, also an important uh, aspect of our training. And this has really helped uh, move our varieties uh, uh, from village to village, fast dissemination of uh, uh, varieties. Okay, uh, training areas, variety development and selection, agronomic practices, crop management, post-service care, gender issues, marketing and saving. If we look at uh, this field, we see in the background faba bean. And this is wheat, this farmer is advised to plant wheat uh, two seasons in a row and come with uh, faba bean or rapeseed for rotation. 
uh, this will uh, keep uh, the health of uh, the field and also uh, increase the productivity. Okay, uh, some of the varieties we have released lately. You can see the year of release. This very old, maybe over 30 uh, years, close to 30 years. This is also old. These are new varieties for the highland area. And uh, this has been also around for a long time. Still farmers like it. These three are new varieties for lowland areas, mid to lowland areas. And uh, <coughs> I think the popular varieties are Digalu, Dandaa, uh, Kakawa uh, for lowland areas from the new varieties. This Digalu, popular variety in the highland area, high uh, yield potential. This is Dandaa. Dandaa, uh, this is 10 farmers growing, uh, uh, doing seed multiplication in cluster. And uh, when they do such kind of multiplication, they usually get good price for their seed. Here we see a lady in the middle of her uh, field in uh, Gimbichu district. This is uh, central uh, Ethiopia near Debrezeit. And this one is uh, far out in uh, north 160 kilometers uh, north of Addis Ababa. This is also the Galu variety, very popular in that area. Well, uh, one of popularizing our varieties is uh, field days. These farmers are ready. It's just one part of uh, the field day waiting for us, uh, ladies and uh, children. On the other side, we have also uh, male farmers, maybe 200, uh, 250 farmers at a time. Uh, this is also <coughs> a field day, not very far from uh, Kolumsa. Uh, farmer explaining how he managed his field, how uh, he likes uh, the variety. And uh, these farmers would very much like to buy uh, seed uh, from uh, the uh, model farmer that we work with. Well, if we look at outputs and impacts, we train uh, farmers. Then farmers look at these uh, trained farmers and uh, then we get several copy farmers in the neighbors and also beyond. Participatory variety selection based on peer discussion, enhanced integration and the community togetherness. This is what we promote. And then we see improved yield and quality from new varieties. Farmer prefer new varieties. We see well-managed fields, high yields and market fo focused production because they produce quality. Uh, grain or seed. So this is just an example of uh, farmers. They are just examples. There are uh, several farmers that we work with. We plot uh, is uh, one fourth of a hectare, 0.25. 
the yields are <coughs> you can see the yields in the middle and also the hectare tons per hectare on the last column that is for the highland variety uh, we also see for cacaba which is a lowland variety yields are a little bit lower but for the agroecology these are considered very high uh, the national average is around two tons per hectare. So we see great improvement with the new variety. We also promote our technologies by appreciating the farmers. We give them certificates. Um, annually, we run several field days every year. And we give them, we give them certificates, uh, you know, this paper. We also give them uh, presents in uh, kinds of uh, seed or tools. And they, this really helps us uh, promote uh, the farmers. Well, we closely work with uh, Cornell, here Dr. Uh, Gordon, he comes to Ethiopia twice, three times a year uh, at peak periods and appreciating the farmer near his field. Uh, this is, sorry, this is Deborah Zait Research Center. We're just trying to see uh, it's a uh, little bit early, but uh, after a uh, few weeks, uh, disease will be, uh, the pressure of disease will be uh, very high. So, uh, Ronnie, Darcy, Linda, we see them. Well, um, this is uh, Malkasa Research Center. Uh, Ronnie is just relaxing with this uh, small kid. Her, father, her mother was a uh, uh, guard at the site. And also sometimes we break for uh, coffee. This lady is a model farmer. A model farmer. Uh, it's about uh, uh, 30 kilometers uh, south west of uh, Columsa. Uh, she grows Digalu and Dandaa. This was, uh, uh, I think, 2011. This season, uh, Jeannie Borlog was at her, her farm and uh, she did even a better job of uh, seed production. This is the famous uh, lady who went to China and uh, uh, just one season before that, uh, she has been presented with the BGRI pin from uh, uh, Linda. Well, in conclusion, international research collaborations effectively slowed down the spread of UG99 across the globe and avoided catastrophic damage to his production. This is what we have seen. Free access to international hydrogen plasm, testing network across regional countries and enhancing national wheat breeding program contributed to generation of wheat technology for small farmers. We have done it in Ethiopia. This has been done in Kenya, India, Pakistan. Uh, generally, farmers are willing to buy improved seed, but not so willing to purchase fungicides. So we have to provide them with 
resistant varieties. Most farmers use fertilizers that apply low rates, yet willing to follow recommendations with consistent advices. So our project, the DRRW, and also AGRA, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, I was also handling that uh, project, has really made an impact that farmers use improved varieties and also use recommended rates of fertilizer. Hence, durable rest resistant wheat varieties are most affordable technologies that farmers ask for and willing to produce for their livelihoods. Well, uh, what others and farmers say are recorded in this slide. Small farmers can make a difference in ensuring food security for the households and the community if given the minimum support they need. I say this, other researchers also say this, because moving from two tons per hectare to four, six, or eight tons per hectare is a big uh, uh, improvement. Our farmers are easily getting six to seven tons per hectare after you introduced the Galu variety to our district in 2009. Yes, this RC Robe district, Mr. Gatu is saying this. We took the Galu in 2009, and farmers before that were getting less than two tons per hectare. It's a difficult soil blood cracking and uh, that really helped them from two to six seven tons per hectare is a big jump small farmers themselves say we have more than tripled our yields after we started using the new resistant press resistant varieties thank you for the training and support two to three tons per hectare is now history this is a reality. Investing in small farmers is the most powerful way to fight hunger and poverty. Bill Gates, we all know uh, Bill Gates is the pillar of the DRRDO project. And they know, he knows, and his foundation knows that this is happening on the ground. Well, again, uh, this is the type of field we see if we use proper technology. This cacaba variety, and we could expect six to eight tons from this field. Yeah, and farmers are they use the marasha, the single plow. But when they use proper technologies, they can achieve such uh, this kulumsa, this uh, pre-basic seed production that we supply to seed producers. And also we use uh, for uh, taking uh, new varieties to our uh, we have uh, around 400 hectares at Kulumsa and produce uh, six to 7,000 uh, quintals or 600 to 700 tons annually. Well, Ethiopian farmers are happy with affordable restoration wheat varieties. Uh, for this, we in the DRR family are very happy in Ethiopia and also outside Ethiopia. Well, I have to acknowledge the ER management for administrative support, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Cornell, DRRW, were uh, visited by the foundation uh, staff often, and that is, has been a great help. CMIT. ICARDA, USID, AGRA, FAO, 
nurse of other countries because we can use their germplasm freely. Ethiopia, Kenya can use, because of the support they give, we can use the germplasm freely. Farmers and wheat researchers in Ethiopia, extension staff of wheat grown districts, seed producers who are also new variety promoters. These are the technical experts and advisors to small farmers. This is just uh, districts around Kulumsa. Wherever we go, uh, we find uh, you know, similar people who are willing to help small farmers. Production goal for uh, food security in Ethiopia. This is not our field. This is cement field in Obregon. But we would like to uh, achieve you know, such uh, management standard. This would probably yield uh, 9 tons or 10 tons per hectare. Uh, thank you. Several questions and then answer them, Beth. Alright, I'll try. Great, so why don't we hear from Erica and then go on to the next question? Yeah, thank you very much. I have a three question in one. Um, how many wheat varieties are there in Ethiopia? Uh, how many varieties were already resistant to wheat rust? Because we referred to some that were already resistant to the project. And third, uh, is your goal to replace all the uh, uh, non resistant varieties in the long run? Okay. Maybe a better response to that one. I was standing on there. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. As I listen, I was wondering if there's any work being done on soil biology in this program, because I noticed when you showed the data for the Danda variety, it was quite a range of results. If in fact what we're seeing is a function of the genes alone, we just have more homogeneity, not a 10.4 ton yield here, a six, and a, I mean, it's such a range. Uh, there's a lot of reason to think that soil biota have a role in the success and the health of the plants. I wonder if you have any soil biology as part of your values to explain the variance you still see, because if you have only one independent variable, you're attributing all the effects to that one instead of the other factors, this multivariate relationship that would have an effect. Okay. Uh, well, regarding the um, how many varieties we have, you know, our research, uh, systematic research, started in the 1950s. And the first uh, variety releases were 1955, two varieties. And since then, we have been releasing varieties. Varieties are released. They become susceptible or low yielders. They go out, we replace. Totally, with varieties we have released are little over 100. OK? Now, uh, the varieties I've shown you for the highland areas and the lowland areas or mid to lowland areas are the one in production. Just 2010, there were two major varieties. One widely adapted, one highland, those were knocked out by yellow rust. So they used to occupy about 60-70% um, of the total area. So we have to start with these ones and you know, do uh, uh, fast scaling up of uh, seed production and dissemination. So 
uh, especially Danda and Kakawa, have really uh, been taken up widely, and others are following. Uh, regarding uh, replacement of varieties, well, uh, you know, re research is a continuous process. We have a number of varieties in the pipeline. Uh, we address three agroecologies. One is the highland. Highland means in Ethiopian context is um, above 2,400 meters. Yeah, and up to 3,200 meters. The mid would be in from um, 1900 to uh, say 22, 2300 meters. And below that, 1800 to say 1500 to 1800 is considered the lowland areas. So these are uh, you know, different agroecologies that we try to address. And for this, we get uh, germplasm from CIMIT consistently, yearly. Uh, I think what we would add maybe in the future is irrigated areas. Irrigated areas would be even lower than 1,500 meters you know, river uh, basins. We have many rivers and uh, uh, th that is a plan. So w we have germplasm uh, at Icarda, at uh, Simit. We also do our own crossing. So variety replacement would be there. These rest variants would certainly appear. We try to use adult plant resistance where minor genes are involved in protecting the variety. Uh, if I come to your question, well, soil management, the major difference, those are farmers in the same agroecology, but managed differently. You have seen 10.4 hect I mean, uh, tons per hectare. That farmer had used uh, urea dab that we gave him. We told him to split twice. Apply at planting urea and also at uh, booting. But he did it three times. You know, 15 kilos we gave him for uh, one fourth of hectare, he applied three times. He applied dab. In addition, he applied compost. And uh, he got 2.6 tons. Farmers estimated, the farmer himself said he will get two tons from one fourth of hectare. Other farmers estimated 2.5, and another farmer, he said, believe me, I've never seen such a field, he will get 2.7. And he got 2.6. Uh, the difference is in the management. Okay, we give them in the same training, but some apply you know, the package, some do not. And also the way they manage, they prepare the soil. That really matters. And we don't know, some may not apply the whole uh, fertilizer. So that is the difference. Even then, the range is uh, much uh, higher than the uh, normal uh, Yes, please. I'd like to ask uh, some questions about the gender issues which you mentioned. Yes. Uh, is it that the women are farming separately from the men who are the laborers? Some details, please. Well, there are um, 
household uh, head uh, female farmers. Usually who uh, do not have uh, husbands. And uh, it's male dominated, certainly, you know, the farming community. Uh, you know, when we say about uh, gender, we, it's not only we in the research, but even the government is addressing uh, gender uh, issues. Uh, that, you know, what they produce is for the family. Uh, ladies, women have say, you know, in the property. In the past, this was not the case. Okay, a male dominated, he decides, he takes and sells. This is not happening now. And uh, we talk to them, and also they talk uh, to us that uh, that has been, you know, not going on anymore. So we really encourage uh, them. Uh, certainly women are, uh, they have uh, a lot, the pressure, you know. They help in the field, the farming, uh, cultivation, and also they work in the house. Uh, men are just working in the field. So, um, but the use of uh, the income is, I think, equally shared or equally managed, if not shared, equally managed. So we see that, you know, improvement a lot. In the past, you know, beating of uh, female is common. Now it's not happening. Yes, please. <coughs> I'm very happy to see this uh, uh, restaurant start varieties in Ethiopia. But my question is, uh, to what extent you are uh, policing the these resistant varieties to reach each farmers? Uh, for example, uh, the collaboration between the local seed enterprise organizations to reach the farmers or to replace that uh, 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 that rest, that, uh, the variety which is mm -hmm. affected by rest. Yeah. Well, we have uh, two informal, uh, I mean, two uh, seed systems, two types of seed, informal and uh, formal. Uh, our approach is mostly informal. We deal with farmers. Uh, also, we work with some private uh, farmers seed producers. Uh, they in turn help to spread the, the seed they produced in their vicinity. Okay, like uh, if you go to Ambo area, Ambo is 112 from Addis, from Kulumsa is very far. There is a seed producer over there. He, we just gave him a starting seed and he produces, he sells, he in fact tries to give only five kilos to each farmer so that this uh, seed is widely distributed. Uh, there is another one in the south, uh, another one in the east. You know, we could reach only you know, a certain area. Uh, in Nawari is very far in the north, maybe around um, from Kulumsa, it would be, I think, uh, 160, 140, then another 60. It's very far. But, you know, we have been there because of the soil condition. We took Danda there, we took uh, Digalu, uh, Digalu there. They had only T, ET, you know, ET 13, number 13. For 24 years, they had only that variety. It's with our project that intervention that they got two more varieties, 
Certainly, uh, I think a couple of varieties also from Adit Research Center. Now they have more varieties. So uh, the Ethiopian Seed Enterprise, Bali Akacha Development, these are public seed producers. And um, I think they are also contributing a lot. But when you face yellow rust epidemic, rust epidemic, certainly there is also government effort to uh, multiply more seed and also distribute to you know, affected areas. And there are also other projects that uh, you know work along uh, seed uh, uh, production and seed dissemination. NGOs also are involved. We can take one more question if there's any last questions? Yeah, okay. So what I understand are the, the varieties that farmers have been using were highly susceptible to rust and are virtually not useful right now. Are they still being um, held? Are, are, are farmers encouraged to hang on to that seed or, or, or to not eliminate it entirely so that when the rust is not such a pressure, they can fall back on some of the other varieties? Are they are the older varieties still sort of in use in small amounts or I'm just concerned about monocropping, I guess? Well farmers usually don't easily let go, you know, the varieties they are used to. So uh, you know, the two varieties that were hit in 2010, one is still around, okay? 2011, some yellow rust problem, certain areas, not epidemic level. So uh, the new varieties, we didn't have enough seed, so they have to plant that seed. So they, they didn't get rust on it, uh, they keep on growing. Uh, last year, 2012, no rust at all in the country, more or less, on farmers' fields. So we see more of the old variety, especially one variety. But these new ones, because of the yield potential, uh, they are also expanding. So uh, next time when yellow comes, yellow rust comes, I'm sure that old variety would be hit badly, and uh, probably many farmers will not grow that variety. Great, well thank you all for coming, and thank you for a wonderful seminar. Thank you.